So I, I want to do something a bit different, just given the nature, oops, given the nature of the panel that we have here. I want to take a minute first to locate who I am in relation to World War II and who I am in relation to the Jewish community today before I talk about who I used to be. Um, and I'll keep it very short because I know we're a bit tight on time. But my father, uh, both, my, both my parents were, were sort of on the older side when they had me, so there's a, a, a bit of a, a generation hop. So my, my father actually grew up in England during World War II. And my, my father, both my parents were Christian of various denominations, so they, they were very lucky that they, they didn't have any added challenges. But he still grew up with bombs falling on his head almost quite literally. And I remember at one point he told me a story about how they'd hear the sirens and they'd have to go to the uh, to bomb shelters and they had those scary masks that they had to wear in case there was a chemical attack. And he was a child. He didn't understand what they were for. And he says that his mask didn't fit. And he didn't realize that that was a problem. He knew it was something that he had to put on, but he didn't know it was a problem. He never told anybody. And it wasn't until he grew up that he realized that if there had actually been any chemical agent in mm -hmm. his area, he wouldn't have survived. Yeah. And um, he was someone who remained very emotionally affected mm -hmm. by his experience in the, in the war. And, and it, and I'll talk about it, I'll talk about a little bit more in a bit about how it impacted our family as well. And to jump around, and to take from Frida to jump around a bit, um, in my in my present day life, I I am now married and I have a family of my own, and I I the former white supremacist am now married into a Jewish family. And, yeah, um, <laughs> and I, I have had the, the, the joy and, and the privilege to experience family life, to experience all the traditions, all the celebrations, to experience the worship. And unfortunately, I've also experienced anti-Semitism from a more first-hand experience than I had ever before. I am not myself Jewish, and because of that, my daughter is also not Jewish either, but I realize, I recognize that she, that Jewishness is part of her identity, and she may choose to convert in the future, and it informs who she is. And it was horrifying for me to carry my little baby in, in she's only three now, so she's still a little baby to me, but to carry my very little baby in the, in the carrier and go for a walk with her one day and be confronted with hate literature plastered all over my neighborhood. It's okay to be white, which is just a simple phrase that carries so much baggage. There was another incident when I took her to a local park and we were there to play with a bunch of other families from a bunch of different backgrounds from all over the world. And there was anti-Semitic graffiti on the slides. And this now is, I guess I'm sharing this because I guess I want to make sure that it's understood that when I speak about my past and how I used to be anti-Semitic and how I used to be a Holocaust denier, that my understanding of anti-Semitism doesn't end with that. And that it, and it continues and it evolves as my family grows and evolves. And it's, and it's painful, and it's horrifying, and it reminds me that as hard as this work is for me to do, and I, I really find public speaking very difficult, it is so important that we all must stand up and speak and share, mm -hmm. and it is only, as I said in the introduction, it is only through the speaking and sharing that we're going to make any progress in fighting back against this post-truth, bizarre era that we're in. So with that, I will now jump back to who I used to be, to be a woman joining a racist extremist group is not normal. I, I don't mean normal as in it never happens, but 
they are very misogynistic as well. So, you know, fortunately for a lot of women, they are repelled by this and, and do not join. I unfortunately was not repelled, uh, at least not soon enough. Um, if you looked at who I was growing up, you would never have guessed, just looking at me, my, my life sort of mapped out on paper, that I would have joined the Heritage Front. I was an honor student, I had friends, I had hobbies. My parents were still together. We lived in a middle class neighborhood. I enjoyed a financial security that neither of my parents enjoyed growing up. But, of course, there's always so much more going on behind the scenes than what you see when you like look at someone from the outside. And there is uh, an organization in Montreal, the Center for the Prevention of Radicalization Leading to Violence, that calls these things that, uh, that make people vulnerable points of vulnerability, which is a very apt. And there's another former extremist in the States, Christian Piccioline, who refers to them as potholes, which is much easier to say, and in some ways easier to understand as well. But whatever name you give it, the pain is the same. And in my case, I, I know there's not time to really get into it, I was bullied at school a lot, and at home, my father, who was trying to escape the horrors of, the, of, of what he experienced growing up, and I, I forgot to mention before that he lost his own father in the war, who was a soldier for Britain. Um, he, was, he dealt with it by drinking and drinking and drinking some more. He always held, held down a job. He always maintained his responsibilities to his family. But he, when he'd come home at night, he really wasn't there. And it was very difficult to deal with that. Both of my parents had additional mental illness challenges that unfortunately expressed themselves as hoarding. And my parents' home, fortunately, was never in a state that you would see on shows like Hoarding Buried Alive or anything like that. We, we could still move in our environment and we could still eat at our table and it was okay. But it was bad enough that we had bugs and, we, and I was embarrassed to bring friends over. And I knew that the way I was growing up was different than my friends, but I, hadn't, I didn't have the words back then to express it or understand it or, or process it in any way. And all of these things and some other things that I, I just won't get into right now just made me vulnerable. And there was one day I was walking home from school and I was talking about how I was being bullied and, and I was talking to this friend of mine and I was saying like, the kids, I don't understand it. They were picking on me because my skin is pale and like, that's not my fault. And I'm just trying to be nice to people and why are they treating me blah, blah, blah. And unfortunately, this friend that I spoke to was a member of the Heritage Front and he pulled out a badly photocopied flyer on some yellow paper and said, this group that I belong to, they might be able to help you. You know, they're, they're a lobby organization, as he put it, for what he called Euro-Canadians. And uh, I, I was just surprised. I had never heard of the Heritage Fund. I had never heard of white supremacist groups, really. I, I had heard of the Klan, but that was an American thing, so I, I didn't know what was going on. And so I took the flyers home and I read them. And I read them, and I read them again. And, I get, you know, I'm, I'm used to speaking to students and I feel like I have to keep hammering home to them. There was no internet, there was no easy access to information, and they just kind of look at me with blank stares. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, that was, those flyers was the only thing I had to inform me of who they were and what they were about. And so I wrote away for more information and they were happy to send it to me. And, I, I, I will skip over a couple things, but I, I ended up reading their magazine, which they were sending me, and there was an article in it written by David Lane, who some of you might have heard of. He was a uh, very dangerous white supremacist in the States who belonged to a group called The Order, and he ended up spending most of his life in jail for his role in the killing of Alan Berg, who was a talk show, Jewish talk show radio host in Denver. Um, <coughs> I didn't know who he was. I thought he was just some loser in his mom's basement as opposed to a loser rotting away in jail. But uh, he wrote an article about how women weren't loyal. That women would sleep with anyone if they had enough money and, you know, this, this kind of nonsense. And I wasn't 
having any of that. So I did what I do best, which is I wrote. And so I, I wrote an article and I sent it to them. I didn't expect them to publish it. I thought they would just say, you know, that's nice. But they ended up publishing it in their magazine in a future edition. And as you can imagine, putting forward something with even a slight feminist message in a misogynistic organization <coughs> created quite a stir. And these people who would love more than anything to put women back in the kitchen, back in the domestic sphere, used my very misinformed ideas of feminism at the time to bring me in. So they would lie to me. They'd say, oh, you know, we, uh, we, we, wanted to, um, we wanted to challenge David Lane, but, you know, he's considered a martyr, so we really couldn't. And, you know, but you are so brave. You, you stood up. We need more women like you. And because I was a young person with low self-esteem and, and was very confused about a lot of things, I kind of lapped this up. And so once they kind of get you in with, with some kind of boost of one sort or another, especially when it's with lies, you don't really know the full extent of what you're getting into, they start manipulating you further. They start giving you more and more information, more and more, I should say, misinformation, and um, again, the, the process of being radicalized isn't just something that starts and ends and, and then, then you're radicalized. It, it keeps going further and further and further. And you can see, you can almost see this getting mapped out online today, that a person can start off in ID Canada and get, and get uh, feel like, oh, they're, they're not radicalized and they're, they're not doing enough, they're not doing enough, they're not doing enough, and then suddenly they're in Adam often. And, and they're in big trouble. Um, so they'll use things like humor. And, you know, people, I, I really get irritated when people say, oh, it's just a joke, relax. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> it's not just a joke ever. Um, these jokes, these words that we laugh at, if we're laughing at some, somebody, if we're laughing at someone else's expense, we're reducing our empathy. And these memes and things that come around these days, they just feed into this and feed into this. And as a woman being in the middle of this, it, it always felt like I was kind of straddling a divide. Because on the one hand, it's like, oh, I'm a proud Aryan woman and all of that. And on the other hand, I had to listen to jokes at my expense all the time. I had to listen to how Women weren't as smart as men. Women weren't as strong as men. Women didn't belong here. And you're only here with us doing this activist work, well, because we, we need you right now, but you really should be at home. And I, I have heard from some researchers that, uh, and they don't have empirical data about it, but they were saying that they see far more women remove themselves from hate groups than men. And I, I think it is this constant misogynistic undertone that informs everything that contributes to that, uh, to that ability to leave. <coughs> In my case, the way I was able to disentangle myself, it, it took some time, certainly. Um, the Heritage Front at that point was being followed around by a documentary film crew. Uh, they were doing a film, it's called uh, From Hearts, uh, Hearts, of Hearts of Hate. Yeah, Hearts of Hate, Battle for Young Minds. And, Peter Raymont was the uh, producer and director. And um, so he convinced me and some other members to be involved in their film. And his crew was following me around with the big 1990s giant cameras sitting on the shoulder like this. And they started asking me questions like, how did you feel about doing this or that? Or how did you feel in that situation? And suddenly, I was being held accountable for what I was believing and what I was feeling. And suddenly, I actually had to stop and think because they, they create such a false sense of urgency, like, we're in peril, we have to do everything right now, 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 that you, that you don't really stop to think. I mean, it sounds ridiculous, but it's just you get so caught up in it that you, that you don't stop. And they finally made me stop, and I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. Um, beyond that, there was the Grant Bristow affair that broke open. Some of you might remember that when uh, 
a CSIS agent was uncovered as being one of the leaders within the Heritage Front. And that just blew open all of the Heritage Front's dirty laundry, it was suddenly <coughs> all over the press, and it was everywhere. And I was learning things that I didn't know before. And they had told me things like, oh, well, you know, this, that, other illegal activity. Well, that wasn't us, you know, we didn't do it. And so I used my uh, propaganda platforms, because they often use women for propaganda purposes, that I was writing and, and doing a telephone hotline, that I'd say, oh, no, that, that was not the Herod Trump. They didn't do that. And I just believed them. And then over time, I started realizing that, no, in fact, they lied to me. They really... <laughs> And not just a little bit. And I, there was one event in particular where they just started, for some reason, started telling me the truth about things. And we were at a party. And I just, I was kind of appalled at how much I'd been manipulated. And I was starting to realize how naive I was to be falling for all of this. And I had, if there was at all an aha moment for me, it was at this party. And I remember looking around the room just for a moment, like just taking a breath and looking around the room at the odd collection of people who were there. And I, I'm not meaning to pick on one demographic in particular, but there were, there, there were grandparents, there were children, there were university students like myself, there were, there were sex workers there, there were hardened skinheads. And it was just very strange to have these people all in the same room together. And I realized that the only thing that we had in common and the only reason we were there is because of who we hated. And I just had this moment of thinking, I, I don't want hate to define my life. I don't know what I want to do instead, but I know I don't want this anymore. Um, and so that's when I contacted with the help of the filmmakers that I've been working with. I reached out to Bernie Farber and and he was kind enough to meet with me. He certainly had no reason to, considering that my friends were putting him on a hit list and so forth. It was not, uh, it, it was potentially not safe for him. And I, I always try to <laughs> give him a bit of, uh, a, bit of a, um, a nod for, for doing that appreciation. Um, so he told me I would have to disengaged completely, and that meant breaking up with my boyfriend, pulling back from all of my activities. And as I said at the beginning, I, I finally went through the Holocaust Center with him, and I realized that there was no other option. I had to leave. I, I had to leave. And after I left, I was able to do everything that he asked, thank goodness, and it was very difficult. But rebuilding life is a slow process once once you disengage from an organization like that because it takes over every aspect of your life. You don't have your life over here and compartmentalized hate over there. Um, I mean, it was informing what I wore, it was informing what I ate, it was informing what TV shows I watched, like everything. And so I, I'm glad that I was still in university when I left. I was studying liberal arts so I was able to take courses in racism in Canada women in history, Holocaust history, and I was able to try to unlearn the garbage that I had learned as, as well as to make new friends and to socialize. And I, I mean, it took years to sort myself out. And as I said at the beginning, my life is now completely different. And I have a husband and a daughter, a beautiful little girl, and I still feel like to, to, to use the, the Buddhist phrase, I, I still have the beginner's mind. You know, even though I've been out of the heritage front for 25 years, I still feel like I am still learning everything. <laughs> I'm still learning all the time. And now I have new teachers in, in, that are my family. And I feel that today we are just facing what almost feels like an unprecedented uprise of mm. hatred in Canada. I'm looking yes. at you for <laughs> confirmation, but it just it feels like that to me. And um, I just, I, I want to believe that if people like me, and there are, there are lots, thankfully there are lots who have left, that people like me can get out of these movements and can move on and can learn and build bridges and 
grow their empathy, if we can all do that, that there's hope. I'd like to believe that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I'll just end it.